welcome to Eplubsum's Fireside Chats. Not as good as FDR's, but hey, it's something. Okay, so I really don't have that much housekeeping for this episode, but I guess I will say one thing, because it's kind of interesting, because it's, the, it's a sad day. This is going to be the first episode I record where I officially say goodbye to Kyle Kalinske. I've officially unsubbed from the Kyle Kalinske show, and the thing that made me really, really just want to do that is, let's see, which episode is it? This one. This episode. This episode, where Cal Kalinske is getting, like, mad at the Progressive Caucus for endorsing Biden over Marianne. Look, here it is. Here it is right here, the comment I said. Imagine getting mad that incumbent Democrats are backing the incumbent Democratic president instead of podcasters' candidates. If they supported Medicare for All, they would back Marianne, because that's something that is in the video. And... Kyle has made a video where he said that Marianne backed off of Medicare for All. Like, and this is the thing, like, like, I'm just sick and tired of it, really. Like, I really am sick and tired of this. Marianne Williamson. Like, I'm honestly sick and tired of all this Marianne Williamson talk. Like, I'm just going to say right now, literally, Marianne Williamson, I don't care. I'm going to see a lot of people who are going to come to my, like, comments and be like, Marianne, Marianne, Marianne. I even, like, D Mr. B even DM'd me and said, like, why do you not like Marianne? I explained to him why I don't like Marianne. Because she said very bad anti-vax stuff. And, like, look, literally, look at Marianne's endorsements. Crystal Ball, Kyle Kalinske, and this guy. This is it. Like, this is... He's mad. Like, oh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, they don't back me. I, I guess I, I really should... I should hold off on this Marianne Williamson talk. I should hold off on this, because that's... No, you know what? Just screw it. I'll just make that the first story. I'll just make that the first story. Screw it. I don't care. Looks like you're using ad blocker. Learn more. Whatever. I'll just, I'll just do this just so I could... Talk about this news story. Bernie Sanders says Marianne Williamson will run a strong campaign and raise very important issues in 2024. Marianne Williamson is challenging Biden in the 2024 nomination, running on a progressive platform. Bernie Sanders told Insider that she'll run a strong campaign and raise because here's what happened. They asked Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders like about Marianne Williamson's bid because that's one of the things. Like, they're trying to gauge how serious Marianne Williamson's 2024 campaign is which it's serious quote unquote and Bernie Sanders like as Bernie Sanders said he will support Biden if he seeks re-election and he doesn't want to speculate about Williamson's chances and Buddy says I know Marianne I'm sure that she's going to run a strong campaign and raise very important issues and Warren of course she's basically said nothing like she just ignores Marianne Williamson entirely because she ignored Marianne Williamson during the 2020 primary. But Bernie, he, since she endorsed him, and he's talked with her, of course, a little bit, he, of course, has more nice things to say. And that's because Bernie Sanders, he has a history of wanting to primary incumbent Democrats. Like, in 2012, in let me see, I'll just, I'll just pull it up. I'll just pull it up. The like, good thing with these visual podcasts, I can literally just pull it up. 2012. Does he have it here? Then Senator Barack Obama. <sighs> I guess I'll just... Uh... Like, you, you know, if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. 2012 re-election campaign. Like, during the 2012 primaries, Bernie Sanders was in talks with the idea of primarying Obama. Like, he didn't, he didn't specifically want to primary Obama, but he was openly talking about the idea of, hey, Obama should face a primary challenger. And that's a thing Bernie has held consistently. He always believes that there should be a primary challenge to the incumbent Democratic administration. 
even if that campaign does not go anywhere. Like how, in 2012, there was a primary, but that didn't really pan out. And the same thing with Marianne. Like, like if you guys actually think Marianne is going to be a very viable candidate, you're sadly mistaken. I mean, John Wolf Jr., he's, like, slightly less notable. Like, maybe people were saying that she'd get, like, 1%, but I don't even know. Let me see. It's really hard to even gauge this, because Marianne Williamson is not really that prevalent of a candidate. Like, one thing that we should make apparent is that one of the big criticisms about Marianne is that she's not, like, a... She's not, like, a... What is the term that they use? Like, major. Like, they're saying that she's not a major candidate. That's not true. She is a major candidate because in the last cycle, she was also a major candidate. She made it on the debate stage in that in that cycle. She made it on the debate stage. Ergo, she is a major candidate. She's at least she's at least on the same level as Kamala Harris because she even got more votes than Kamala Harris. She is a major candidate. Is she a serious candidate? That depends on your definition. Like, for example... Vermin Supreme can be considered as a serious candidate, but he also probably isn't. But he was there to raise, not really raise issues, but like raise awareness about like certain things. But like, is she more serious than say, Mike Ravel? Yes, she's infinitely more serious than Mike Ravel, but she's still not that serious of a candidate. And the reason, one of the reasons why we very much should not take Marion Williamson that seriously. And why I do raise a lot of issues and hesitancy about Marion Williamson is because of this. Crystal Ball, last time she got involved in a presidential campaign, it was to try and get this guy to be president of the United States. She ran a state senator to... She made a state senator resign from his seat... And built him up so much to be like this very prominent presidential candidate. And he dropped out in January. Literally two months. He had a two month candidacy. And again, who was the person who did this? Crystal Ball. Crystal Ball is the one that did this. And now Crystal Ball is going to, is literally one of the leading figures to get Marianne Williamson to run for president. Hmm. I really do not think that we should be because like, because I don't even like Crystal Ball. Like I hate Crystal Ball. I literally don't not like Crystal Ball. But yet, yet, but yet, all these people who don't like Crystal Ball, now all of a sudden, they want they are going to Crystal Ball's candidacy. Like. Literally, this is, like, I mean, and here's the thing. This is hilarious, because even the online, like, the terminally online left does not necessarily <laughs> agree with this. But here's the thing. Marianne 2024 is the new force to vote. And we know this because of the Kal Kalinske video I just showed you. The reason why I don't like Kal Kalinske anymore. He's now using the... Marianne Williamson 2024 candidacy as a litmus test. Much like how forced the vote became a litmus test for progressives in Congress. This is stupid. This guy is literally saying, if you don't support... And let me show you. Let me show you. I can show you. Because I, I have the visual podcast. I can show you. William Williamson. I could show you vaccine health and vaccinations. The both a both and approach, both prayer and medicine to physical and mental health has been attributed to Williamson. The approach, the efficacy of prayer, accepts medical science as part of God's power to heal. For example, surgery see, surgery may be seen as God answering prayers to heal. The logic invokes John Hopkins medicine and calls it an Williamson, who believes that spirit is imperative to illness, confirmed this belief and said that people who were prayed for get out of the emergency room faster. Williamson has stated her support for necessity, stated her support and necessity to a value of vaccine distribution, but has been criticized for her skepticism about pharmaceutical industries' influence in setting guidelines on how they're administered. She 
She's saying the descriptive definition between sadness and clinical depression is artificial and having called the process in which clinical depression is diagnosed a scam. During Williamson's presidential campaign, several excerpts from her past comments have conflated her skepticism for the pharmaceutical industry's trustworthiness with an embrace of anti-vaccination dogma. As a result, she's been accused of being anti-medicine and anti-science. She denies such accusations, saying it could not be further from the truth. But critics point to Williamson's January 2012 interview on her radio show, Living Miraculously, with Gwen Olson, a 15-year-old veteran of the pharmaceutical industry who implied that she previously believed antidepressants could be dangerous and linked to autism. Critics also said a podcast interview with Russell Brand in which Williamson, while speaking about vaccines exceptions, glibly describes the process in which vaccines mandated as Orwellian and has likened the debate about vaccination mandates to the abortion debate. She later apologized, saying that she misspoke and the comments erroneously made her sound as though I questioned the validity of life-saving vaccines. But this is the thing, like, and this is one of those things, because I've, I've talked about stuff like this before where it's like, useful idiots, like, at best, she's a useful idiot to anti-vaxxers, like Russell Brand. Russell Brand is an anti-vaxxer, if I remember correctly. Yeah, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, she, like, this is, she went on the COVID denier guy show... And has a history of anti-vaccination. Like, this is the thing. Like, it's, like, it's like the same thing with a lot of other people. It's like, dude, I'm just criticizing Israel. But you always happen to frequently engage with anti-Semites and open anti-Semites. And Mary Williamson is like this. Oh, I believe vaccines are good. But she always manages to go on anti-vax shows. And basically say enough wiggle room that she is in the same boat as them we don't need a candidate like this after COVID-19 this is just absolutely a bad idea look and I'll just say it like I legitimately just, will just say it I don't care if Manny Williamson is going to be a litmus test I want it to be a litmus test about how actually serious you are if you want to make Manny Williamson a litmus test then I'll make Manny Williamson a litmus test too supporting Manny Williamson actually like not even like oh, you're just supporting her because she's the only other option. Like, if that's the case, that's whatever. But if you're going to put Marianne Williamson, like, hashtag Marianne Williamson 24, excitedly support Marianne Williamson, excitedly, like, do all this stuff to support Marianne, then that should be the litmus test. If you do that, you're not a serious contender, and I don't think you're a serious person. It's like forced vote. You're a forced voter? I don't care. Screw off. I don't have time for your nonsense. Anyways, speaking of nonsense, let's just move on to the story that I was originally going to make first. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, there's currently been some trouble with Mexico in regards to, uh, like, gangs and stuff. Gang violence has risen a bit in Mexico, and now Republicans are introducing a bill to set the stage for the U.S. to use military force in Mexico. Like, yeah, the hands-off Mexico thing is true now. Like, hands-off Mexico, we should be spreading that hashtag around like crazy. Senator Lindsey Graham on Monday said that he was prepared to introduce legislation to set the stage for military force in Mexico, saying that it was time to get tough on the neighboring country after four Americans were kidnapped by armed men this week. Graham told Fox News host Jesse Watterson, Waters that he would follow the advice of former President Trump on Mexico policy. I would put Mexico on notice, Graham said, if you continue to give safe haven to drug dealers, then you are an enemy of the United States. Graham added that he would introduce legislation to make certain Mexican drug cartels foreign terrorist organizations under U.S. law and would set the stage to use military force if necessary. I would tell the Mexican government, if you can't clean up your act, we're going to clean it up for you. Literally at this point, in tr just through saying he wants to invade Mexico. Now, I, I originally stated that this wouldn't happen because Mexico's too close to the border. But I guess, whatever, that makes, I guess, some form of sense. And... Dan Crenshaw has apparently gotten into a lot of, like, Twitter drama with... Has gotten into a lot of Twitter drama with the... With some Marana people. Like, I think he has gotten into a lot of fights with Ricardo Monreal and his brother, David Monreal, who's the governor of Zacatecas. Dan Crenshaw attacks AMLO for the murder of two U.S. citizens and Tuam Pilas. Dan Crenshaw, U.S. Congressman, attacked the President of Mexico, Andres Manuel Obrador, after the murder of two citizens in the United States, nationality and maternal 12 Vilas, 
It should be remembered that the Texan legislator presented an initiative in which he proposed that the Army of the American Nation fight organized crime cartels in Mexico in the Mexican territory, and given the situation, he expressed whether AMLO represents the people or Mexican cartels. And AMLO has, of course, criticized him for this, and so has basically every Morena person. And this is coming along the same time as AMLO's attempt to reform the INE, well, abolish the INE and then replace it with a new electoral institute. So, of course, this is leading into, again, this is happening. All of the forces are coming together. We even got some people who are like, like, this is how weird it got. This is how funny it got to me. Like, this is just funny. Okay, let's see. <laughs> like, this is just funny. Hold on. Gotta get the page up. Like, this is how desperate they've gotten. <laughs> well, let me see. Here it is. Like, it's gotten so weird that Jose Antonio Maid has literally trended on Twitter for a couple of days. That's how weird it is. This is the first time anybody has actually talked about how Jose Antonio Maid and not been the bots. Maybe these are bots. But anyways, AMLO has made a massive response to this. And this is quite an interesting response. Here, why don't we take a listen? Repetimos. A México se le respeta. No somos un protectorado de Estados Unidos, ni una colonia de Estados Unidos. México es un país libre, independiente, soberano. Nosotros no recibimos órdenes de nadie. Aquí manda el pueblo de México. ¿Sí? Con, porque esto, ellos lo están haciendo con propósitos propagandísticos, ya agarraron lo del fentanilo, que este, es responsabilidad de México. Aquí nosotros no producimos fentanilo. Y nosotros no tenemos consumo de fentanilo. Y lamentamos mucho lo que está pasando en Estados Unidos. Pero ¿por qué no atienden ellos el problema? ¿Por qué ellos no combaten la distribución del fentanilo en Estados Unidos? Los carteles de Estados Unidos que se encargan de distribuir el fentanilo y más a fondo ¿por qué no atienden a sus jóvenes? o cambian su trato hacia México o desde hoy comenzamos con una campaña informativa en Estados Unidos para que todos los mexicanos nuestros paisanos sepan de esta alevosía de esta agresión de los republicanos a México. Y si continúan con esa actitud, vamos a estar eh, insistiendo de que ni un voto de mexicanos, de hispanos, de los que quieren a su patria, recordando aquello de Blades, de que el que no quiere a su patria, no quiere a su madre. Ni un voto a los republicanos, que ese es un pueblo independiente, soberano, costó mucho. De allá donde están hablando, todo eso era de México. Que no se olvide. This is, this is good, this is no, good, 100%. lo admitimos. I'm quoting it, it saying like, I'm not quoting no somos... it saying like, common and loyal. Not AMLO L, AMLO W. And this is coming, of course, because, you know, a lot of, like, this is coming because, as many people have been trying to point out, like, Hispanic vote has steadily risen for Republicans. So, I don't, like, I don't think it's necessarily Mexicans who are voting for Republicans. I think it's, like, again, mostly, it's mostly Cubans, maybe to a degree, some Mexicans, but... Like, as he's saying, he wants to try and make, spread an information campaign to make sure that no Mexicans vote for Republicans based. Anyways, here's an uh, interesting development. Pentagon bars Biden administration from evidence of Russian war crimes. Pentagon has blocked the Biden administration from sharing evidence of potential Russian war crimes with the International Criminal Court, according to officials with knowledge of the matter. The intel reportedly includes details of Russians' intention to target civilian infrastructure and abduct Ukrainian children. 
Although Congress modified legal restrictions in December to allow the U.S. to assist Ukraine in court investigations, the behind-the-scenes tussle over whether to continue the administration has divided. Pentagon leaders reportedly don't want to help with the tribunal's investigation because it could lead to a precedent that would encourage them to prosecute Americans. See, this is a big problem. <laughs> like, like this is this is where we're starting to realize, huh? The neocons starting to have to face repercussions for their actions because, like, of course, people like the Pentagon and you know, all of the and like Western military and neocon and neolib type people would of course want to spread awareness of Russian war crimes extensively, but now we're reaching our limit because. Now, if if we start investigating Russian war crimes, we'd have to investigate American war crimes. Hot take: we should investigate everybody's war crimes, and no, and every singular leftist has agreed with that sentiment. Every war crime should be punished, and that includes any done by this guy. Anyways, there's not much else I could say about that. Everybody's war crime should be investigated. Next story is coming from Chicago. One of my predictions has been right. Wilson has endorsed Wallace, cites concerns about tax hikes, Johnson cutting the police budget. Now, one of the reasons why I want to talk about this is not just because I was right, but because of this funny, like, line. If you defund the police, how are they going to do their jobs? That's the point! That's literally the point, Wilson. Look, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to read the... Like, like, this is just funny. Like... First of all, I was right, but this actually does spread a little bit of a concern. Because I saw this on Twitter. I don't know how true this is, but I saw this on Twitter, and some people were saying that this is a little bit worrisome for Brandon Johnson because Willie Wilson, let's show the map. Willie Wilson, uh, does it show? I don't think it shows like based on the wards. No, that's precinct. This is the wards. Oh, he doesn't have any... Uh, Support in the wards. Now, let's see. We're going to have to zoom in in the map. Uh, dang it. There was, one, there was one map that showed that he did prevalent in certain areas. I think it was, like, around down here. But basically, he did, like, much like the last race, apparently he did really well in certain African-American areas. So, naturally, people are again concerned about the idea that he could be a kingmaker in the race, and now he's backing Volus. And people were saying, like, people were saying that he would inevitably, like, like they say, like, certain number of people in Chicago, in the African American community, are, in fact, very conservative on the issue of crime. They're not really that much into the whole, like, defund the police type thing. <laughs> this is a very bad, this is a very bad sign. And it says right here, like, what Black Chicago's political establishment says about their leaders. Roderick Sawyer endorsed Paul Vallis. Holy crap. <laughs> I, I just learned that right now. But, like, yeah, we're starting to see certain people of certain establishments are now starting to head in different directions. So we're starting to see some developments. Speaking of developments, oh boy, we're getting a very interesting development here. Rosendale poses for photo op with white nationalists, denies meeting, condemns hate groups. This guy is trying to pretend that he didn't meet these white nationalists. In fact, many people made the joke saying, like, these two are very obviously white nationalists just by their looks. Congressman Matt Rosendale, a Republican who represents a wide swath in Montana, is coming under fire for posing for a photo with a group of white nationalists who claim they met with him recently while visiting the Capitol in Washington, D.C. Rosendale's office denies the meeting and explains that the group simply asked for their photo with him outside the Capitol and as he obliged. He said that he did not know who they were or their background. The photo appeared on Friday on a Telegram account controlled by a prominent white nationalist, Grayson Arnold, who shows four other men standing by Rosendale. The group includes another well-known white supremacist, Ryan Sanchez. The other two men standing with Rosendale could not be immediately identified. Both Arnold and Sanchez have posed recently about being about being in Washington, D.C. at the invitation of a member of Congress, but it is not said who invited them. All while the group may not have known may not have been known to Rosendale, they are well known to other members of Congress and the Republican Party. 
Arnold Zomar, nationalist pro-Nazi blogger who runs Pure Politics Channel, a site for white supremacists and neo-Nazis, including memes praising Nazis as the pure race and lamenting American victory in World War II. Well, let me see, because there's one thing that says here. Uh, like he, Arizona Republican current chairwoman Kelly Ward. Like it says, like at one point it says during in here that. Look, even a member of Rosendale staff had drawn some scrutiny. Grace Davis, the community's director of Rosendale, lists working for the organization Alliance Defending Freedom, which is considered by... Like, apparently one of Rosendale's own staff members works for a hate group. Wow. <laughs> And it says like, and I make the I made this joke when it happened like, like, oh no. Another white another member of Congress has to meet with a white nationalist, not again. Now here's the thing, for those who don't know, I sometimes post on this website, but this is a funny thing that happened, so like. I made the joke again. Republicans official 300, 378 does a photo op with Nazis. We've got to stop pretending this is an accident. I'm willing to give them a pass. It's not like they can catch every tourist at the Capitol. But then it's like, they of course mentioned that these guys are prominent Nazis. Extremely prominent Nazis. But of course, again, it's, it's always like, aw, they just, they frequently, it's just an accident again. And here's the thing. Republican takes pictures with neo-Nazis. Republican, again? How does this keep happening? And then this guy shows up. Hick Hickey called me Blitzkrieg. Now, having the name Blitzkrieg in, in the name should probably give you an indication, but let's read. It's a bit tiresome when grown adults pretend they don't understand that, yes, in a two-party system, all extremists of the right or left will favor one party over the other. Also, the U.S. media and press establishment no longer recognizes the category of left-wing extremism which may seem a little unfair, kind of the way the media promotes the perspective of the Democratic Party to an extent similar at which more typically associated with overseas dictatorships. I respond, right-wing extremists, everyone who is not an able-bodied white Christian is a second-class citizen, if not full-on exterminated. Left-wing extremists, everybody should be equal. Hot take, right-wing extremism is wrong. Now, here's the thing about Hickey Cormby Blixtrig. This guy's like an actual fascist, like 100%. Like, and you don't need to look further than this. Out of nowhere. Like, out of literal nowhere. Just literally, just completely out of nowhere. This woman is an imbecile. There is no way she has a triple digit IQ. Her, her every utterance is an embarrassment. She will be gone soon. Like, like just randomly out of the blue. Oh, I'll just type this right now, because this is funny. Hold on. Nah, I, nah, I don't really want to engage. There's really no point in engaging with the fascist. But yeah, the dude is just like, literally just full-blown fascist, doesn't matter. But anyways, speaking of fascism, not really fascist, but I just wanted to say that. Okay, so very interesting development happened. Like Matt Gates introduced a bill that would introduce the War Powers Resolution to remove the United States Armed Forces from Syria. And as you can see, it failed by a massive margin. Tragic, very tragic. Even more tragic when you realize it, it like look, literally it just shows how bad this is. Double digit people in both parties voted against it. Sad, like just sad. Let's look at the nays. No, not nays. The yas. The yas are the people that we give props to. Achenklaus, Balent, Berrigan, Bean, Briar, Biggs, Bishop, Blumenauer, Blunt, Rochester, Bobert, Bosanami, Bowman, Breachin, Buck, Burchett, Burgess, Burleson, Bush, Camrick, Carson, Kassar, Chu, Clark, Klein, Cloud, Collins, Comer, Connolly, Crane, Deluzio, DeSalineur, Dingle, Doggett, 
McDonald's, Emmer Espiliet, Fry, Gates, Garcia, Robert Garcia, Gomez, Good Gosar, Al Green, Marjorie Taylor Green, Griffith, Hagman, Harris, Hearn, Higgins, Hoyle, Huffman, Hunt, Jacobs, Jayapal, Jordan, Joyce, Kelly, Kana, Kidley, Larson, Lee, Lee, Luna, Mace, Massey, McClintock, McGovern, Mang, Miller, Mills, Mooney, Moore, Napolinto, Nels, Norman, Obernight, Ocasio-Cortez, Oogles, Omar, Pallone, Perry, Pingree, Pocan, Posey, Presley, Ramirez, Rosendale, the Nazi, I guess there is a reason to say, speaking of fascism, Roy, Sanchez, Santos, Sklamlin, Skachowski, Squirt, Thanadar, Tiffany, Talaib, Takuda, Tonko, Torres, Trahan, Vargas, and Velasquez. Now, as you notice, there were quite a number of people who I supported, who at one point I supported, that did support this, that did, like, do bad. Let me go to the endorsement page. This hasn't gotten to the Senate yet, so we have to wait for that. So let's see. Who were, like, Raul Grijalva voted, voted against it. Tragic. Jamie Raskin voted against it. Tragic. Uh... Takano voted against it. Uh, I think it's actually it. I think those are literally the only people who voted against it. Teresa Liga Fernandez, she wasn't there, I guess. I don't know why. Now, oh, and Maxwell Frost voted against it. Now, here's the... Oh, and uh, Jasmine Crockett voted against it. Yeah, but that's it. That's it. Those are all the people that are left. Because there were other people that were on there that I did just flat out remove. Because it was like one of those one one more strike and you're out type things. I try to gauge certain people politically. And I'm trying to figure out like who would I actually just flat out remove. And honestly at this point the closest people that I might remove would probably be Takano and... Um, maybe Crockett. But, I, but one of the bigger things I'm waiting on... Like, I'm trying my best to wait a little bit longer for certain things. Like, one of the big things I'm 100% waiting on is the introduction of a of the single-payer bill. I really want to wait for that. I don't think any of these people will vote against it or not sponsor it. But if they do not sponsor it, then I am going to be removing them. I just want to make sure that we get all that down. And I think maybe... Like, because... I'm going to look at... I'm just going to be blunt and say why certain people will stay on and not others. Crockett might be removed because she wasn't even the one that I initially backed. But, again, I'm going to have to wait and see. I have to look I have to look back at some of the other, like, very important votes. Maxwell Frost? He might be removed, but I don't know. Maybe just for the novelty? I don't know. Okay, let's see. Raskin? On oh, first Takano. I might remove him, but one thing that is very like interesting is just the Bernie endorsement. Like Bernie endorsement means that I give might give them a little bit more credit. But what about Raskin? Raskin didn't endorse Bernie. Maybe. But then again, he might also be being just moved up to the Senate race because many people say that the incumbent Maryland senator might retire and then Raskin might run. So, maybe he'll be there to that. And Grijalva, to be blunt, I think, I think Grijalva, much like how Ro Khanna got to stay despite the anti-socialism vote, I think Raul Grijalva's just grandfathered in at this point. Like, I think, I think he honestly is just grandfathered in. But, speaking of this vote, this vote has actually led to a very interesting development. The Libertarian Party chair announces an effort to primary members of Congress. Libertarian National Ch Committee Chair Angela McArdle announced on social media earlier this week the commencement of a deliberate effort to, in to target incumbent members of the Republican and Democratic parties. In addition, McArdle said that in her intention, she intends to engage with other third parties to accomplish the endeavor. 171 Republicans and 150 Democrats voted to keep our troops in Syria without a declaration of war or any meaningful reason. I will absolutely be working with other third parties to primary the shit out of the most vulnerable war hawks. Operation Warhawk Removal has officially commenced. 
the, com the commitment organized in response to the tweet from the Libertarian Party in New Hampshire, which itself is bringing attention to the recent failed vote in Congress to withdraw its troops from Syria, sponsored by co-sponsors include... Nah, nah, nah. Like, like I mean, I'm kind of wondering, like, why didn't, like, any, like, Democrats explicitly... I don't know if they explicitly, like... I don't know if these guys just flat out just didn't include people in it, but I think maybe just Republican, like Democrats might have just not sponsored it just because of Gates and like the the Republicans, but they would vote again, like vote for it. Now, of course, many people are, this is the biggest part that is very interesting. She has stated she intends to primary them, which is very interesting. She intends to primary people not run against them in the general election. This is quite an interesting endeavor. And I very much, <laughs> I think this means that the Libertarian Party is essentially dead. Because I think after like the Rage Against the War Machine debacle, I think the Libertarian Party is literally at this point just dead now. So yeah, that's very tragic. Not really that tragic, <laughs> but whatever. Okay, speaking of things that are tragic, this isn't tragic. We're going to be moving on to the main topic of this video. Another political quiz. Oh boy. I'm sure we've never, ever, ever seen me do a political quiz before. Very interesting. So, this one is going to do a very interesting thing. Now, I took a... Let me see. In the system of the new political spectrum, you'll find three conceptual axes that allow us to describe three major trends of each of them. Some of these possible variants in 27 ideological positions, among which you could be located through this test. The diagram illustrates the system using cells, columns, rows, and levels, but note that the examples for each variant are approximate. Now, of course, one of the first things you'll notice is that this test is in Spanish, and that is one interesting thing. I am I am looking into doing like more tests from other countries because I do want to see how they actually view politics. I want to expand outside like the Anglo-Western sphere. But anyways, this is the test that they want to do. I do kind of understand what they're saying, because like some of this isn't really that hard. But basically, this is the social axis, and this is gonna show like this is my social views. Like socially, I this is center right, centrist, and center left. And this is my economic views and uh, my political views, like authoritarian versus like anarchy. And this is, this is, I think this is actually a very interesting way to do the test. Because, like, it puts you in a, va a vastly different spectrum. It doesn't lump certain things together. Like, like it does, like, for example, the political compass test lumps basically social views and, like, authoritarian versus anti-authoritarian. And I think this is just a very interesting thing. So let's see the ideologies we got here. We've got Christian anarchism, traditional communalism, paleo-libertarianism, Libertarian conservatism, neo-reactionaryism, classical clerical fascism, national Bolshevism, and socialist Christian. And this would be just center, center right. And then here we got anarcho-communist, mutualist, libertarian, classical liberalism, lib liberal, ca liberal capitalism, classical fascism, Marxist-Leninism, so democratic socialism, and ancom, if I didn't say it already. And then here we got post-anarchy, e egoist anarchism, left libertarianism, social libertarianism, Jacobinism, tech, techno, technocratic progressive, post-Marxist communism, and Luxembourgism. I'm very curious to see where I would end up. Hot take, I think I might end up, like, I'm pretty sure I might end up, like, like I'm going to end up in one of these areas, but I'm curious to see where it would be. It would be, I would be very surprised if I end up in this section at all. All right, so let's just get into it. We got 30 questions, and each of them are very interesting. So let's start. Political authority. The op... Okay, so we just... We don't really get questions. We have to just go with the answers. Okay. The, op, the optimal functioning of a political community requires strong leaders who maintain peace and order for progress. The only legitimate way to organize political community is through free association and voluntary agreements. The optical functioning of a political community requires the strengthening of democratic institutions and the limitation of reforms aimed at improving the functioning of the state. I'd say that, probably. Political action. We must take definitive steps to achieve our proposals, even if it requires the use of violence. 
The achievement of our goals requires direct action, self-organized civil resistance initiatives at the group or individual level. Our goals and proposals must always go hand in hand with democratic institutions, dialogue, and consensus. I guess that. Social change. Currently, there is a great revision of many values, habits, and ideas of the immediate past. It is necessary for the state to play an active role in this process, either imposing social transformation or holding it back. Social transformation should be influenced by changes at the individual group level, not by authorities. The state can legislate norms to influence people's habits and values, but these must be submitted to a popular vote or other democratic procedures. Probably the third one again. Did I do a third one for all three of them? Yeah. Law and justice. There are only norms created by man and mediated by the state. Any unjust law is not a law, and it is a moral duty to disobey it. Legal norms are legitimized through democracy. Only dialogue and consensus have a decisive character to resolve the controversies of an increasingly plural society. Hmm. Legal norms are le legitimized through democracy. Only dialogue and consensus have a decisive character to resolve the controversies of an increasingly plural society. Hmm. This one's very difficult. Hmm. I might just have to go with the third one again. It's kind of stinks. I don't want to keep doing the third one. Security. The new population surveillance and monitoring systems are a good tool to combat crime, which owes, n which owes nothing, fears nothing. Surveillance and monitoring of citizens at the expense of their privacy, whether by state or by companies, is a crime and must be prohibited. The state should have permissions and surveillance to monitor citizens, but only in cases provided by law in which an explicit mandate from each competent authority. Hmm. I guess just for the sake of this, I might have to go with the middle one. Yeah, just overall, not that. I get, I get, hold on. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know, because that third one, it's like, it kind of makes sense, but then it's also like... Does it just mean, like, the authority can do it whenever? Or is it, like, only under certain circumstances? Maybe? I don't know. Mm. Yeah, but I do think, overall, people should be held... People should have their own privacy. We must limit immigration? No. Generalized border control is a relatively recent phenomenon. Free movement is only position with freedom. Immigration brings positive benefits, but our borders must be controlled so as to not encourage irresponsible policies and social changes. <sighs> I guess technically three. Military service. Military service must be compulsory, disciplined, united society. No. It is unacceptable that an institution instructs us to kill our fellow men for state interest. Alternative defense solutions must be devised. Yeah, I'll just go with the second one. This one makes sense. Ultimately, I don't really like the military that much. Governments should not limit freedom of expression. Uh, never an absolute right. Should only limit freedom of expression of extremist individuals or... No, just flat out nah. I believe, I believe freedom of speech. I'm a free speech absolutist. Religious freedom. Religious tolerance falsely assumes that all religions are equal and that their respective influences on society and distinct authorities must act to promote a world of human values. Society must be organized independently of religious or irreligious dominations, and that authorities must not put up particular values or moral norms. Religious freedom is a right, but this does not prevent the state from supporting a majority cult, historically rooted in the population. Society must be organized independently of religious and irreligious dominations. I guess second one. Education. The authorities must issue and monitor educational plans and programs at all levels, whether in public or private institutions. The authorities must not interfere in the education of children, as this right of families and by extension of local culture and religious communities. The authorities should limit themselves to organizing and running state management institutions and ensuring that everyone can access it. Hmm. I think technically the third one. This one, I think, kind of comes off a little bit more like authoritarian, so... Modes of production. We must support private ownership of the means of production. We must overcome the capitalist model of production. The basis of exploitation cyclical crisis. Second one. Market. The market is free or it is not a market. Regulations must be reduced. No. The market is inefficient. The allocation of resources should be planned. 
market could be used for allocation of resources, but it must be wildly regulated. <sighs> In between these, but I'll just go with this one. Money and currency. We must establish a regime of monetary freedom, free currency competition, dollars, gold, Bitcoin, etc. Ideally, money should be abolished and replaced with work vouchers or ration cards. We must maintain a regime of monetary sovereignty, a national currency controlled and monopolized by the government. I guess technically that. Look at me. I'm not like I'm one of those. I'm not necessarily one of those ones that truly is like abolish profit or abolish money, because at the end of the day, money is kind of needed. But I would also like to believe that. Like, I believe we should have access to more of it. Like, that's not really my forte in the idea of that. I think that's a little too, like, far off in the distant land. Okay, let's see. We must eliminate or reduce taxes to the minimum possible. Most of them are moral and wasteful. We must apply a strong policy of progressive taxes in order to distribute wealth and increase social welfare. Taxes are an essential element of the social contract, but we must apply a reasonable fiscal policy as to not incur a deficit. Second one, banks. All state intervention on money and credit must be eliminated. All private banks must be closed and credit centralized in the hands of the state. The monetary authorities must control money and credit to ensure economic stability of the nation. Foreign trade. There should be no limitations on foreign trade. It should be free and its tariffs should be reduced or eliminated. Foreign trade must be eliminated in an effort to independent self-sufficient economic structures. Free trade can be beneficial, but it is permissible to apply protectionist measures to according to a strategic planning. Hmm. Like, this one is technically, like, close. But, I mean, like, it, like, not, like, I don't know if it's, like, is it just translating that wrong? No. No. Nah. I'll just go with this one a little bit. Hmm. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Catch a tiger by the toe. If you holler, let her go. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. My mom told me to pick the very best one. And you are it. So just for that, I'll just go with this. Salaries. Wages are formed by market process. To increase them, we have to increase productivity. From each according to his ability to each according to his needs. Yes. It is not necessary to intervene on the price system because these communicate pertinent information to all market principles participants. Prices should be set dynamically by central panning offices, for example, cybernetics. Market mechanisms can shape prices, but they must be controlled to ensure availability and access to certain goods and services. Hmm, I do believe that we should like try to control prices to be as low as they can be. Social services should be provided by free business competition. Thus, a welfare state must be guaranteed through strong and well redistribution policies. One hundred percent. Exclusive, exclusive property rights over national resources usually guarantee the development of optimal. No. Should be freely accessible without any kind of limitations derived from the presence of property rights. Manage at the communal state level often guarantee optimal resources. Again, it's a little bit of this because it's like one of them is clearly like the super extremely fringe far left one, and then one is like sort of like the moderate left one or moderate ish one. Mm. I guess technically to a degree, this one. Our obligation and moral duties derive from supreme universal principles founded by human nature. No. No knowledge or moral principle is true regardless of the opinions of people's circumstances. Our moral obligations and duties derive from national, empiric, and non-ethical criteria such as minimizing suffering or... Yeah, that one. Human identity. There is a human nature that... And this can be reached... Nah, nah, there is no human nature. Man exists as a project to be carried out. He is radically free and master of his own destiny and purpose. There is human nature, but only the result of biological constitution. Probably that one. We must honor the past. No. Culture is an artificial social construction. The tradition is an instrument of disciplinary power that serves to dominate one or the other. Cultural and tradition should not be practical ideals because they threaten diversity and undermine healthy and dynamic social cohesion. Mm. Yeah, that one. Religion. Religiosity is an inherent characteristic of the human being and plays an important role in uniting people under ideas and percepts that transcend them. 
Religion has a dire has had dire consequences on the progress of humanity. It is a tool for social manipulation and a great detractor for societal reason. Religion has always been important to human beings, but it must be reduced to normal consciousness and not reveal itself to social public life. I'll go with broadly this one. Egalitarianism. Egalitarianism is an obsession with monarchy. It is a rebellion against the nature of them. Inequality is the product of social circumstances, therefore it is possible and beneficial to eliminate them. Yes. The traditional family, the original element of social co architecture, must be protected and preserved. The traditional family, bastion of the patriarchy and heteronormity, is an institution that slows down progress and must be overcome. There is no better or worse type of families because, above all, it is an association that arises from the will or one or more adults established with long-lasting intimacy and care. Ultimately, the way family is, it is basically patriarchy. Feminism. Feminism in all of its variances is harmful individuals to send in it. Societies organized under the androcentric order that places women in the status of subordination and exploitation. We must deconstruct this order to emancipate women. No. Like, this one is definitely... I was reading I was reading the second one, and it's like, no. LGBTQ Homosexual acts are intrinsically disordered. No. Sexuality is a historical and social construction. The, the normal and the abnormal, the illegitimate and illegitimate, are denaliated by discourse... Through the power of sexual emancipation means abandoning sexual identities. We must combat the climate of intolerance and discrimination against sexual minorities. We must support LGBTQ movement. Sure. As long as this does not cause new legal inequalities. Biotechnology should be restricted for two therapeutic uses. We must make the most of capacity of biotechnology to transform human beings and improve upon them. Transhumanism is not something that is intrinsically bad. The problem lies in other aspects, higher levels of inequality, and the consent of prenatal modifications, to give examples. Like, honestly, I don't really care about this question because transhumanism is bullcrap. So I'll skip it for now, but I'll come back to it at the end. Human beings have a legitimate right to dispose of animals and material goods. We must fight against sacralizing of nature, which is inherently anti-humanist and misanthropic. We must fight for animal liberation and the recognition of their rights ignored by the validity of anthropomorphism that is destroying the planet. The environmental fight is a priority, but is not because preserving nature is an end of itself. Mm, kind of a little bit of that. A little bit of both. I'll just go with that one. And my result is post anarchy. Quite quite an interesting development. Let's just read up on it, I guess. Post anarchism is a revision of classical anarchism, sometimes through the influence of post structuralists. Nah, nah, nah. I don't know any of these people. Yeah, this is kind of uh, interesting. I don't remember what question. I was going to do the thing where it's like, maybe if I look back at the other questions and see which ones I guessed wrong on. But I don't even remember which ones were they. Maybe I'll check again. It doesn't really matter. But anyways, this is just an interesting quiz. Feel free to take it for yourself and see how it is. Thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. And click the bell if you're notified if a future video comes out. And if you need more content from me, you can go to my website, follow me on Twitter, join my Discord, or consider supporting me on Patreon.